So first of all, thank you very much for your presentation and your article. Uh, we read it and we found it very interesting. So we are going to discuss um, it with some extension or some just remarks. Um, I am Naomi, here is Marie and uh, Bobby. I can't change the slides. Oh, okay. okay. No, it's yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so first, I'm gonna propose a very short summary. It's not very necessary because you you did a very uh, comprehensive one. Then Mary is gonna propose some remarks on the article. Um, uh, also, Bobby will uh, propose uh, some extensions uh, on uh, other cases, and uh, also we. We will try to connect it with another article about <coughs> conflicts on uh, the um, on planning of nature in France. Uh, like this. Okay, so yeah, at the end of the article, you emphasize on uh, four main points uh, that I will just uh, summarize again. Uh, the projects that are uh, presented as mitigators of uh, gas emission are depolit depoliticized, as you said. But the extension of those infrastructure are the opportunity for repoliticization uh, because new places are involved. So th this has two consequences. Uh, first, promoters construct uh, territory imaginary to obtain local uh, consent, as you said, and also they produce an ontological framing. Uh, there is two other consequences. They um, no, sorry. While assembling those fears, you maybe you lead to the opportunity to politicize again the, the infrastructure project. So this was very interesting. And also you raised the question at the end of the appeal for modernity, of, of modernity and if it's compatible with ecology. And we also thought that this was a very important uh, question. Uh, we may just have a, a question or a critique about the uh, social justice that is not that much, um, um, uh, sorry, um, raised in the article, so we were we were interested by, by this one too. Um, yeah, but I first will comment more on the notion of the control of nature you mentioned. So uh, the promoters of the project uh, presented the project as if it's really easy to combine this modern approach with um, ecology and all the goals with it. And so we really have that idea of uh, yeah, the techno-optimism, which you mentioned before. Um, however, um, with climate change, we're obviously going to have some impacts, which also impacts waterways in the transport uh, function. So either it's going to be droughts or floods or both, depending on the geography. And these potential impacts of climate change were not so well addressed by um, the project designers. So we were wondering um, how this, um, yeah, or we were looking at different projects where these, um, where that was more considered and therefore where also more adaptation measures were uh, developed. However, uh, yeah, and we were looking at a case of the Rhine and the Seine River and um, it was re really interesting because also there, um, although they did develop some adaptation mechanisms to climate change, there was still the techno-optimism where the ultimate goal in the end is to, yeah, contain the business as usual and not really change the way uh, the economy works, but rather try to develop the technology so to fit in. And um, yeah, this was partly explained due to the path dependency of the engineer engineering strategies, but also the... <laughs> strength of um, the coalitions favoring these hard infrastructures. Um, but yeah, we were just thinking that um, Im the impacts of climate change might actually result in a scenario where we are not really able to use these path uh, water um, waterways to actually contain our way of infrastructure. And therefore we wanted to ask you, yeah, I mean, you mentioned that in the article as well, but maybe you could further comment on that. Um, if you think there's even a space in society where we can reimagine some futures which consider these uncontrollable forces and which acknowledge them rather than pretending that we always have the control about everything. And a second um, thing we wanted to point out um, is when we think about um, 
emission reductions. It's mostly not only transport infrastructure, but also the energy transition. And here in Europe, we have the dominant discourse of um, yeah, legal, giving the ligament uh, to implement green energy infrastructures because we mitigate uh, CO2 emissions, so as in the case of the canal. And um, this is also a way of depoliticizing. And um, we were just thinking that um, we should have more discourse here like regarding the implementation of certain infrastructures such as wind farms or so on and in some cases i think it's also done like that gave rise to the whole not in my backyard discourse and so on but then i think regarding the green energy transition it's also important to connect it on a global scale and look at different local conflicts which then connect on a global scale because uh, for this green energy transition, we need a lot of metals and minerals, which are often, um, which often come from countries where the ecological damage and also therefore on biodiversity uh, is really, really high. And also therefore the populations there face negative social impacts. So we just claim that um, these CO2 emission uh, mitigation projects not only have a impact on that local uh, sphere, but a multiple local spheres. And we were just wondering um, whether, yeah, we could use that method methodology you used to connect these different uh, local scales. Yeah. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to try to connect it with an article we thought it could be interesting to connect with because, uh, I mean, it's an older um, um, uh, article, sorry, but it's uh, related to conflicts about uh, nature planning in France. I'm, I'm sorry, it's very France-centered today. Um, so um, this article is interesting, we thought, because um, it is, uh, so first, there is a very heavy theoretical framework, so I'm going to try not to focus on that because I, we, we thought it was not the most interesting part. But they try to identify in many conflicts in France about uh, the nature planning, uh, they try to identify different ways to see the environment and the local territory that is impacted by the conflicts. So maybe we could link that to different fears or different motives, as you, you said. And they also try to identify different ways to connect it to other a way to express those fear or this they call it justification modes but so different argument to support or more here to oppose a project and so they um i mean we did this table uh, to try to sum up everything i will not go into detail but uh, i think what is interesting is that we can see that because of the position of the actors uh, because of their relation to the um, environment, they will have a different vision of it. Uh, the owner or the local inhabitant will have, uh, will see it as, uh, will see the project, for example, as uh, th threats for their quality of life or they just their property. It can be also a threat for their uh, community life because it's a local environment that is used. And in the case of the canal, we can see it because you have, you have, I don't know the. We don't know what is going to happen to the canal, if it can be used for the tourism or for people just to walk or uh, anything like this. Um, and with this, they identify also a way to express uh, those fears or those uh, just this opposition. And um, we thought that maybe, I mean, in the article, we can see that some of uh, some arguments are more audible than other, other. And maybe it's because they are related to other way to express uh, their, I, I don't know, any fear or uh, any vision of the environment or any other thing. Uh, here are the different ways. And I'm going to I didn't take two examples. Uh, for example, you see the environment as your property or as your local environment. And so the impact of a project will impact the, I don't know, your heritage or your quality of life, for example. Uh, furthermore, we have uh, the market value of ecological assets, for example, uh, in another example of the article, you have uh, a project that uh, highway project, 
project that was changed because it had an impact on vineyards. Um, and in the case of the canal, I imagine you have other cases like this, like farmers who were impacted by this and all of that. And maybe the market value of the nature is more audible for uh, promoters or officials because it is related to a discourse they are more used to, I don't know, to listen because it's about money and, and market value. And maybe just very fast last point, um, maybe between the two articles there is an interesting change is that the um, uh, the gas emission uh, mitigation is really not taken into account in the first article. I mean, they don't say that it's a depoliticizing thing and it's something that is uh, very promoted by promoters. So maybe it's a change in the narratives of the promoters that are now using this to to say, oh yeah, it's a very good project and all of that. Uh, so here we are going to discuss about a 360 degree framework uh, for uh, analyzing the infrastructure sustainability. So here it has been analyzed uh, in the uh, four dimension. One is environmental, social, uh, institutional and economic by uh, taking into account the five angles of the resilience, inclusiveness, technological aspect, uh, productive and flexibility. So in the paper uh, that we received, it is uh, really uh, good that we got uh, lots of dimensions from the socio-technical perspective but uh, it will be more engaging and practical for us if we could get uh, some other broader viewpoint in terms of uh, institutional dimension and social dimension that based on the quality of the uh, vulnerable communities and what is going to have impact on the right of the people and also uh, what is the uh, it is increasing the level of inclusiveness and uh, whether this path is uh, directly aligned with the uh, overall objective of uh, the country and uh, uh, from the paper that we heard that uh, a strong motive and objective of the, this canal was uh, to address the capacity issue uh, for the, uh, for that reason the old canal was not uh, being uh, not uh, being usable so um, this was a st uh, strong objective for the new canal, but uh, after a few decades, maybe the same issue the new canal uh, can face. So, uh, as the author has mentioned, that uh, when uh, what we want, what type of society we want nowadays, is also uh, important. Whether it is uh, preservation or the progress, uh, and uh, there is also important issue to address this infrastructure uh, expansion. So uh, related to, to this infrastructure ex uh, expansion, we have a case study that is really burning issue here uh, in Southern Ferns, uh, that is A69 motorway. Mm, the, this is uh, the um, 53 kilometer long uh, uh, motorway that is going to connect the uh, CAS to Toulouse. And, uh, the uh, proponent of this um, uh, infrastructure is saying that uh, it is important because it will increase the attractiveness of that region and also it is uh, going to reduce the time of the uh, user though uh, already on uh, that road there is already existence of another uh, infrastructure that is national uh, 126 and uh, it will also create uh, new formal jobs about thousand jobs is going to be created uh, and also some informal jobs and it will also facilitate better mobility mm, but uh, on the other hand the opposition uh, opposition are saying that um, uh, this uh, is actually another way of the uh, destruction of the nature and also um, the neighborhood surroundings as it is going to uh, destroy uh, 2,500 uh, trees and uh, the another fact is that the current uh, road that is already using, um, they are proposing to have uh, you know, some development on the existing infrastructure, not to have the new one. Um, but. Um, in this project, uh, what has been uh, found that uh, in spite of having lots of protests like hunger strike and lots of legal challenges, the government has chosen to prioritize the uh, development of uh, that uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, choose not to uh, con uh, work for the environmental conservation. So this actually raises the concern for the power dynamics uh, between the government industry and the civil society and also it uh, makes the question about 
about the ability of the uh, environmental activists to influence the decision making process because uh, these types of infrastructure has a significant amount of public money so if their decisions are not also uh, taking into account then what uh, kind of uh, things is going on um, and uh, these types of issues, uh, though it's local, based on uh, country to country, but nowadays it's not uh, anymore local. Uh, it's a, a global issue that you can see uh, by going through this uh, link that almost in every country this uh, debate about the infrastructure and environment is going on. So, um, as the, our author has been said, that it's high time to address what type of um, society we want, what type of um, uh, uh, world we want for us. Uh, we need to take the decision whether it's uh, time to go for more progress or uh, preservation. Uh, that's all. And uh, there are some open questions for continuing the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, you don't have to answer all the questions. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we sit here doing the whole night, and nobody wants this. I think, even if you would be great. Uh, so you can pick the, whatever comments and questions you want to pick, and then we'll open the floor, and we have a volunteer over there to distribute that, uh, a nominated, a nominated volunteer distribute the speech. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you very much for the job you, you did. Um, I agree that I didn't uh, address social justice in the uh, paper, uh, especially because uh, promoters of the canal uh, have a, a, a narrative of inclusivity that is really exceptional. Uh, they are going to provide jobs with uh, and to uh, educate people uh, for the jobs that are going to be there. And so uh, if we wanted to uh, politicize the, the, the project, it was not on this issue because this, it seems to be okay for local people. But as you said, there is also uh, always a question of scale. Uh, if it provides some jobs for uh, the, the society there, it, it might have some effects uh, on other parts and especially uh, we could ask uh, where the materials come from. Uh, uh, is it uh, uh, extractive uh, practice elsewhere and maybe threatening uh, uh, social justice elsewhere or environmental justice elsewhere. But um, the reason why we focused on biodiversity was because Precisely in this project, this was something that was completely lacking and especially because um, uh, there are some cases in the world where uh, there is um, a connection between the uh, condition of living for some people and biodiversity. Uh, there are some uh, places where biodiversity is uh, respected because it provides uh, a quality of life for, for leisure that is really exceptional and so you have elites that pr um, promote this biodiversity but you have also places where it didn't directly impact livelihood and it is not either uh, uh, respect by elites it's just considered that these areas are not of any interest especially for biodiversity and so we can uh, <laughs> screw it up with a completely new project and there will be no issue. And so the challenge of the project was even in this type of area, we can speak about biodiversity. And as you mentioned, I think this is really important. Well, the, 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 the area, the, the, sorry, the era where, uh, the, the era uh, we are going to experience is an era of uncontrolled future. And this was really out of the scope of the promoters and the idea that uh, we cannot control nature, we cannot build lagoons that are going to be a very nice area for frogs, and just like this, it will maintain by itself. No, it doesn't work like this. Uh, most wetlands are under um, uh, processes of uh, uh, being floods regularly and evolve. 
and you have no natural flood uh, beside a canal. So this process of maintaining by nature such wetlands will not occur. And so this idea that we cannot control completely uh, nature was part of what we tried to say and it's when we said parasites may come with the climate change and etc. It was a way to challenge the promoter. But what I understand from your question is that we could have gone further and we could have said, okay, this is really a bad job uh, because you promise so much and you cannot. The thing is that uh, given the society we were talking to, um, this uh, promise of something that is under control was very important. And so when I, I'm not considering myself as an activist, but just trying to raise issues that are already there, but uh, delegitimized by the promoters, I wanted to re-legitimize some critics, but not to the point to say more than what the people there were able to address. And especially this idea that we are going to uh, uh, to have a journey in an uncontrolled environment was really not um, um, uh, supported by any activist there at that time. But this may change. And I know that some students from the University of Compiègne, who are very nearby, are now trying to address much more uh, challenging questions to the promoters and probably this type of question. Then, um, of course, uh, well, the, the, the comparison you made between our uh, approach and the theory of justification makes really good sense. Uh, um, uh, yes, to promote nature can be done on different bases. It can be done for different interests, but also based on different justification of what is the common good and uh, especially um, uh, the biodiversity around this canal, what common good is it? And I think that in the different scenarios we built, we tempted to say it is a common good because there is this question of uncontrolled uh, nature, but also what are resources for uh, uh, the people, but also uh, the question of uh, um, uh, the the, um, uh, the landscape we are going to live in, but also the question of uh, um, health uh, with dust and etc. So there are many different ways of justifying nature. Some are very anthro anthropocentric, anthropocentric. So some others are more um, uh, are considering more the question of. Uh, uncertainties of nature and so we may preserve nature not because it, it provides some ecosystem services but also it provides things that we don't know and uh, the fact is that because nature has been there for a long time probably it is more secure to protect it as it has functioned in the past uh, rather to go in completely uncontrolled future so that's uh, well, thank you for raising this question of uncontrolled future. I think um, that was missing in my point, Anna. So I open the floor. Thank you. Take the system again of raising one, uh, for the numbers and then collect the free questions so it's clearer. So who was so first? Okay. Um, hello. Introduce um, yourself, don't forget. Yes, Professor. I know um, who you are. Thank you. Uh, I'm Yaksh, I'm from India. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a question specific to the methodology that you followed on asking people what their perception of biodiversity looks like. And what I. It got me thinking a bit because in India, and I don't know what other countries do about this, but as children, we are, when we draw a scenery, for example, or when we are taught about what our nature should look like, we are not 
taught about landscapes which actually exist in India. We are typically told how to draw a scenery. And for the first time I actually saw something like that was last year when I moved to Europe. Uh, and I mean, it had, it has something to do with our colonial background, but it's also got a lot to do with how biodiversity is perceived by cultures which are geographically isolated. And South Asia happens to be a very isolated subcontinent, which is culturally very distinct. Um, so just to go back to my question on this is, when you ask somebody what their idea of bi biodiversity looks like, especially in a country like France, which happens to be a very diverse country and has a lot of migration, um, when you build scenarios based on this, do you actually account for the diversity? And how does this difference in the perspective of biodiversity in North and South get factored into what we consider biodiversity losses <coughs> an ideal shape of biodiversity landscapes uh, in studies like this. Yours, I said first. <laughs> so, uh, here? Yeah. Yeah. Here. But you asked her to moderate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure, you're right. Yeah. Hello, I am Paola from Mexico and uh, Recently, I started studying for my thesis the renewable projects, uh, energy projects in Mexico and the social environmental conflicts surrounding them. And I also find like in these cases, this kind of techno optimistic discourse mixed with the climate urgency as a way to de delegitimize the resistance of the people. But at the same time, I can see how the actors involved even like in the same within the same resistance, they have different interests because as, as as we say, they have like different perceptions and they have different ways to value nature and to value the the socio environmental impacts of these projects. So at least in the case that I am reading about, it's about not being again against the project like in general, but it's against like the size of the project, like the size of the land it requires. So, but for example, for some people, uh, the project also uh, represents like a way to, to, to develop, to have like a positive impact. And a solution that I have seen like to these cases in a very institutional top-down approach is that the government and the corporations, for example, measure the impacts, the, so the social environmental impacts. So they, for example, identify and recognize that there are a lot of uh, negative social impacts and also positive ones but they say like okay but the negative impacts are like in a low level and then the 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 good impacts are like a very high level and in a long term so i i i don't think is this is like a way to to approach the situation i am against of measuring all things uh, but at the same time i wonder how in this kind of situations how can we uh, have a consensus? How can we come up with a consensus? But not, I, I think the way of this like top down approach of measuring things and saying, okay, but this is more, more, more important for the government, more important for the corporations. I am against that. And my very, my very radical point of view is like saying, okay, if people oppose the, the project, then it shouldn't be uh, built there. But some people are actually not against the, the project in itself. So how, how can we find a solution to these complex cases? Hi, I'm uh, Linda from the Netherlands. I have two a little bit related questions. Um, the first one is, uh, I really liked how you started with matters of concern. And I was wondering if you could also do that, but with um, like hopes for the future if it's possible to to somehow connect futures with hopes that people already have in the present. And then I would also want to ask if you would be open to reflect on your position as a researcher in this, because I find it super interesting that apparently it requires some work to translate people's daily experiences to uh, uh, futures and and choices political choices that need to be made then what 
What is the role of the researcher in this? Because you say you're, you're not an activist and you don't want to go beyond what people say themselves, but you do have a kind of privileged knowledge position because of your science. So I'm wondering how you relate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for these uh, wonderful questions. Um, first, I want to uh, answer your, your question. Uh, um, I should make it clear that I didn't and never asked people about their perception of biodiversity. That was uh, one of our first understanding is that this word means very different things, has a very colonial perspective. Uh, and so we didn't want to enter the, the field with these questions. It is a very scientific notion and people do not experience biodiversity every day. This is really a construction. We don't want to ask this question. We wanted to ask a question about what is in nature or in, but also nature is uh, uh, biased as a colonial concept too. But so we want to address what is the, the, the materiality of their life is going to be changed by this project. And I think that this question, um, if you want it to be inclusive and if you want to reflect on uh, the, the colonial bias that you may introduce, you have to be very reflexive on uh, what is the good word uh, in concerning the, the, depending on the context, uh, how do you raise this concern about the materiality of lives, uh, of livelihood. Sometimes it will be much more on what people are able to produce uh, in terms of farming. Sometimes it's going to be uh, how people are uh, concerned with their health uh, issues. Sometimes. So I think depending on the context, there is a, 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 a work that needs to be done on how you ask the question appropriately so that what is going to be collected is really reflecting what people experience. In, but the, the, the origin of research is to gather the livelihood and the materiality of this livelihood and how people are concerned that it may be hampered by this project. And so given this objective, there are many ways to ask questions intelligently so that you do not uh, um, uh, compress or you do not uh, deny uh, what people are going to, uh, to say or, or could say. Yeah. So, so that's a way to answer your, your, your point. Um, so, of course, when you have a project, uh, there are this issue of how you combine the different impacts, the, the pros and the cons, and how you come to a decision. And that's a big thing. And, and my understanding of this is that um, the way people um, uh, react, appropriate uh, these issues, react to these issues, understand these issues is multidimensional. It's really something very complex. And if you try to uh, reduce this complexity on a line of impacts, it's really a reduction. And we will, we need to be aware of this reduction. It's like uh, something very violent to reduce everything you believe in, in terms of positive impact, negative impacts, and we are going to weight it. And of course, it's much more complex than that. And especially because this impact has also an impact on another one. It is interdependent. And so wh while you seem to build a procedure that is very rational, actually, the line itself is a narrative. And we should present it like this, because there are many uncertainties that are not taken into account in this procedure. But once you say that, that democracy, or uh, at least our democratic procedures, um, need a decision. And what is specific about uh, infrastructure project is that usually you don't have three different projects that are on the uh, desk. And you can say, OK, you can vote for this one or this one. But usually, the question is, will this project go or not? And, and so it's a zero or one question. And th this is also a frame. And in my uh, experience in this uh, case, um, it was a really 
the question. And that's why my first motif is, will this kennel be there in the landscape or not? And this is really something important for people. And there were a lot of people who told us, you know, in our area, there is no project, no public investment. Uh, all public services have disappeared. And so it's a huge opportunity. We are happy to have this kennel. And you are going to ask a little question of bi biodiversity? It's not interesting. And, and so, OK, I do uh, agree that the opportunity of a project in itself is a sort of a, um, um, uh, pr pride for, for, for the territory to, to be uh, uh, able to uh, spend public money on something. And so that's why I didn't really challenge and say, uh, uh, instead of this, uh, I didn't try to uh, uh, provide a scenario with no project at all, but rather to imagine and to give some ideas that in the way building this uh, project, it can go uh, on a track that was not really designed. And so that's more what we did uh, in order to open um, the opportunity for a debate on maybe it will not happen just as it has been imagined and but you may have a different way of uh, uh, um, uh, coming to the public debate on a project but I thought in this case that uh, uh, the twist that we made on this project saying yes it could happen but not exactly what you thought uh, might open more discussion especially for people who were so um, um, pride, uh, sorry, so, so proud to have this project there. So it was a way to, to make some uh, maneuver <laughs> to, to, to have more discussion. Um, your question on hopes uh, for the future, of course, that would be, yeah, very interesting. Uh, what are, but again, in this specific case, People have many hopes for the canal. And so it was very difficult to get something else. And that was the, yeah, the, the, the power of the promoters were that uh, they concentrate all the hopes. And it was very difficult to have either ideas. And especially because this area is lacking some uh, initiators. And so the projects that were there, well, there were just one. And it was really difficult to imagine. So yeah. Speaking of fears was another way to, to address another future. But as you see, um, uh, or maybe uh, you will see in, in all the, the scenarios, um, we didn't build scenarios of catastrophe. Uh, we were <laughs> uh, willing to imagine that even if it was not what was designed, uh, it may be twisted in a way that people will live with this. And so we wanted that at the end, it was positive, but when, uh, something funny is that when we present the scenarios to the promoters of the canal, they say, oh, this is science fiction and it, all, it is all about catastrophe. I say, no, but well, that's your point of view. It's a catastrophe from the point of view of the promoter, but maybe for the society it's different. So that makes me come to our position as researcher. Um, uh, I don't think that um, it's a difference in nature uh, of um, um, it's rather uh, a difference in 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 job and so um, talking about biodiversity in a public debate that is framed without biodiversity uh, is not neutral so you have to uh, enter with a frame that is different than the dominant one and a way to present activists is that there are people who are bringing a frame different than the dominant one so i could and i have been uh, identified as an activist and some uh, promoters said oh do you feel uh, at ease with the fact that we are going to say that gabriel boulot is an activist and that is what you are doing with asking all these questions that are not desirable for our project and, and etc. So intimidation was part of our experience. But I don't feel that uh, I've been acting as an activist because 
um, I didn't do the job of mobilizing people. So what I've been uh, producing are narratives that have some science in it, but the job to uh, mobilize people to um, uh, support or discuss this narrative, I didn't do that. Uh, not because I don't think it's a good job to do, but rather because it's not my job. Uh, and so uh, really knocking at doors and having people reflecting on what I've uh, been writing is not what I did. But recently I've been called by a student of the University of Com Compiègne saying, oh, you worked on this project, what do you think? And I said, what I think has been written in this document, do what you want with the, do your selection and go. But that will not be my purpose because I know that I'm much more efficient in writing articles and collecting some science and, and that's not a question of uh, judgment, it's rather a question of competences. Thank and you for... <laughs> Other questions? I don't know. You said uh, 6.30 or 6? Six? Uh, 6.30, but uh, we, we, we were reading when it was on. Hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm Owen from the UK. I have a question about um, the like public consultation process and particularly how it relates with time. Because I appreciate the value of taking into account biodiversity and other other such considerations um, like I definitely appreciate that but in the current framework the way that it affects this decision making process to my mind is mostly that it extends the time periods through which a through which a decision is made so the, whereas a process might have taken 10 years like 30 years ago, now it stretches longer and longer and longer, where both the case for not doing the project and the case for doing the project becomes a bit blurred because, I don't know, the business case changes or the ecological case changes. I wonder if you have some thoughts on how we can improve the consultation process, not to not to reduce its quality or the aspects which it considers, but more to um, provide, maybe, I don't know if certainty is the right word, but sort of streamline the process slightly to like reduce the time, the time element and the confusion that creates. Thank you. So a very... Um, Let me, your name and your... Ah, yes, uh, I'm self, so I'm Portuguese. Um, I have a very uh, slightly nitpicky, but it's something I... Uh, of a topic I find particularly interesting, which is how to uh, design good um, interviews. And one thing I found interesting is that you said, so if someone does not um, demonstrate um, a preoccupation with a certain... or, or, it, or if they don't... Um, show preoccupations with the things in my in case you'd ask in the end so other people have referred uh, this and uh, i would like to ask if you could clarify a bit more about uh, in what circumstances that question would be asked because what i what i thought was that because an interview is not also an interview for the interview it's also a social interaction uh, questions of um, you know pride shame that sorts of things do come into play I was thinking that, so if I was an in, in, in an interview and uh, someone asked me, oh, but the, uh, the other people, they're talking about the birds, uh, they'll put me in a situation where probably, oh, yes, of course, the birds, the, they're very important just because um, it's put an, in a it puts people in a position where you uh, get where I'm trying to, to say. And I would like to ask um, if, uh, uh, well, that would create a bias and what do you do or what can be done to avoid it? It's a very specific thing. Yeah, yeah, but very interesting question. Is there question? Uh, it's like in a marriage now, the very last time, otherwise... <laughs> well, the, the, the first question is really difficult because, um, yes, the more democratic is the process, 
the longer it is. Uh, and so um, it's true that um, if you consider that we know what needs to be done, um, then the democratic process seems to slow down this uh, uh, even, uh, event of having the, 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 the project done. Uh, so, uh, but, the, the, but the thing is, I'm convinced that we don't know exactly what we need, and that's the point. Uh, and so, and especially talking about infrastructure uh, that are re really huge investment of public money, uh, is it needed? Um, my understanding is that if we have slowed down the process uh, these last years, it's to the benefit of not doing very bad projects. And, but it is a compromise. And there are also very nice projects from different point of view uh, that are also slowed down in the process. And of course, we defend different projects. And so the one we would like to speed up and the one we would like to slow are different. But all in all, my understanding of the general picture is that there are very pushy interests to make projects that have no real general interest. And there is a huge stake to raise uh, hands and, and says and voice to, 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 to uh, stop this project, so to say. So being in this uh, general picture, uh, I won't do the job of uh, streamlining the process of democracy because I'm thinking that uh, it needs that time to really uh, come with the proof that we will not benefit from this. But of course, this is more complex than that. Uh, and on a one specific project, you don't know if it's a good or a bad project. So that's all the, the, the problem, so to say. So I know that uh, I, I cannot really address your question, but it's just how I deal with this uh, problematic. It's easier to answer the second questions about uh, my bias by asking people a uh, question with framing the question by uh, putting on the desk the fact that other people had brought this and you didn't. And, and but the bias is not uh, so huge because I'm not investing in the fact that they say, oh, yes, it is important. This is not what I'm collecting. I'm collecting argument of why it may be important and new information, new knowledge on how these birds relate to their lives. And so see, if there's you say, yes, it's very important, I would say, okay, nothing. <laughs> but if they say, oh, that's interesting that you are speaking about birds because in my garden, they're all dying. And I think it's because of, I don't know, the forest there that has been uh, damaged by a fire, then I connect fire, forest fire with these birds. And this link was not present in my precedent uh, collection. And so I'm trying to get not only the forms, but the motivation attached to the forms and why it matters. Uh, and, and is it a question of uh, beauty? But most of the time, it's not only this. It's also a question. So, I was not uh, asking for aesthetic judgment on nature, but rather how they are interacting with their livelihoods. Uh, and so in this, it's not so much a bias to bring something to the fore, because if it doesn't match with their livelihood, I will see it. Uh, and so they could be tricky and say, oh, yes, I'm going to imagine something that makes, uh, that uh, uh, creates a link that is fake, but actually, well, I had the, the previous time of the interview where people explain how they live and what they cherish and etc. And so they cannot really, well, they, they could, but, but I think I have some elements to see if really they are imagining something or if they are bringing something that is uh, important for them for uh, a logic links. Uh, that was not explained before. So um, uh, I think uh, you're, you're right. 
if you are asking uh, uh, very precise question and you are asking for a yes or no, then you cannot uh, frame the question with what are others' perception because it completely biased the system. But if you are asking for understanding and why you think it's important for others also, then I think the bias is less. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I forgot I was here. Hello, I'm Stefan and I'm from Denmark. I wanted to ask you two questions. Uh, number one is regarding, I, it's my, my understanding that people generally fear change. I just, just as a total general matter of statement that people, they don't really like change so much. So when you wrote up these fears, I was curious about, you know, had you asked into that? And then the secondary thing was that a lot of the lots of the, the fears, they revolved around like trust and governance, like the ability to actually, uh, you know, follow through on the deals and arrangements they made. So I was also curious about like, if you decided to try to gauge like the individuals that you were speaking with, what their belief in the governance is just as like as a general thing, not in the concrete case. Yeah. Um. It's, oh yeah. Yeah, maybe another question. Yeah, sure. That's one. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks for volunteering. Um, mm. It's true that people fear change. So any change will be, uh, will uh, produce some reluctance. And so maybe um, it's not surprising then when we are asking people about what do they fear, they answer something. Uh, and maybe it's just that maybe they will be very happy in the future, but for the moment, because it's a change, they will oppose uh, the project. But actually, in my case, most people we uh, met were really happy with this change. And it was really difficult to enter with another picture. And especially because, you know, it, the people we, in, we thought would be the more critic, uh, critical about the project, especially people responsible for water resources or people responsible for um, uh, the, 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 the municipality that will be uh, the most affected by uh, um, uh, the earth that would be digged out of the canal and put uh, in their surrounding. And so the landscape is going to be modified completely. Well, these people were not opposed to the change. They really uh, applaud to the project. And so given all this positive feedback on the project, which didn't address at all biodiversity, this heuristic of fear was, was a, a mean of questioning these hopes and this uh, uh, acceptance of the project. Not for, um, um, uh, not that I consider that when people are all uploading to a project, uh, it's a bad thing, but rather because nobody was speaking, was voicing the biodiversity issues. And so my point was not to say these issues are very important and somebody should void them, but rather, isn't it a way, it, isn't it a, a, a topic that is silenced? Because it's very difficult to express it when you don't have the support of an argument that, is, that has been um, equipped by science. And so at the end of the day, I was ready to hear that everything was fine with biodiversity and people applaud to this project and it was fine. But this was not exactly what happened. And my understanding is at the end of the interviews, we get this, uh, this uh, uh, verbatim, people say, yeah, this canal is something that should happen. But in terms of uh, uh, this and this, there are huge uncertainties. And they might be a matter of concern in the future. 
um, is it just a question of being afraid of change? Well, it is part of it, but it's also the fear that we have in, t in facing climate change and, and, and uh, biodiversity change. And um, I, I, in, in industry, when you bring an organizational change and people are reluctant to this change, the way to uh, um, to pass or to, to overcome these difficulties is to help them to imagine them in the future. Um, we try to imagine them in another future, but also to flesh out this future with some biodiversity issues. So I, I understand your point, and I'm not sure that what we collected were just um, ordinary fear about anything new. It was especially so hard to get people involved in materiality of living things and what is living in this area and what is necessary to uh, uh, maintain this life. Uh, I think it was something different than just we want to keep what we have and something different also from okay everybody is uh, uh, okay with this project but we scientists want to make some uh, noise and we want to uh, bring reluctance where it doesn't uh, spread uh, by itself. It, it was really about what is necessary for life in the future, can we build this together and especially because life cannot speak by itself, can we speak for life based on our concern for life? I hope I understand. I, I answer your question. I, um, I, I didn't attempt to say that, it, I, I wasn't attempting to say that you were making a mountain out of a molehill. It was more like just to grasp the individuals that you were talking with, what their normal set of uh, yeah. worries were. And that's also my okay. second yeah. question. Yeah, uh, on trust and governance. Of, oh, yeah, exactly. That's why then you just to gauge them as individuals. Yeah, uh, especially because uh, most individuals that we interviewed in a process of uh, asking questions about from the political science perspective, uh, as I told you, I, we, we screened our uh, interviewees as people of, not all people of power, but people of decisions. And, and so decision makers in very different uh, setting. And so there are uh, uh, um, uh, heads of NGOs, uh, uh, elected uh, uh, people, um, uh, state office, uh, head office, and uh, and I think you raised a good point. It would be interesting to evaluate uh, their perspective on governance and do they trust governance or not, and that would probably um, give a different picture on how uh, the different concern they raised is also connected to their general perspective on, on governance. But um, we didn't do that, and um, my feeling was that um, we didn't really met people who were um, completely distrusting, or, or uh, who, you know, um, we didn't find people like. Um, yellow jacket uh, uh, movements uh, opposing uh, the big government or the deep government. We didn't have any narrative about uh, the uh, government distrust as a whole, but rather people who were concerned by um, how to improve decision. Um, and yeah, if I try to remember what was in these uh, uh, interviews. Uh, probably if we didn't really ask this question about trust in governance, it was because it didn't raise as something that was very important in our interviews. But I think we should uh, be more careful about this in the future. Uh, that could explain a lot, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, not in this case, but in other case, I'm sure that uh, the, the, the question whether they trust all the process, for example, is very important. But um, 
in our case, um, people were quite uh, uh, confident that the Prefet and uh, the Société du Canal de Seine-Nord would take into account whatever would come up about uh, the issues they raised and and uh, and when we discuss, we are going to ask you about uh, nature, your practice, uh, the landscape, and etc. Um, many of them consider that uh, this will feed back the project and improve the project. And uh, it's not the case everywhere, but especially we, we, because in this area there were no activists against the project. That's also a, um, give you a sense of this context. That is very different from the one, uh, the, uh, um, the um, highway uh, that you mentioned in the south of France. There we had a sort of a social acceptance of uh, uh, and trust, yeah, probably more than in another part of France uh, and uh, in other projects. So we probably undermine or uh, underestimate this but I think it was also not very present, so to say. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much for... Uh, <laughs> the presentation.